Live from the 607, it's the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour, where we're talking everything movies, TV, comics, and entertainment. Join in the conversation on social media with the hashtag ODPH, because here we go. Welcome to an all-new edition of the ODPH Podcast, better known as the Ocho Duro parlay hour what's happening everybody thank you so much for joining us this week my name is ken m joining me in studio as always you know him he's the co-host his name is padawan j hello 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 folks we have a lot to talk about in the land of movies tv comics and more you are tuned into the entertainment edition of the odph and we definitely want to keep that conversation going with you after the show So, Pad, where does everybody head to? ODPHpodcast.com. Right on. You swing on over to the website. You check out the social media links. They're all right there on the front page. You check out the T Public Store link. Can't thank everybody enough for the amount that was sold this past Memorial Day weekend. Yeah. Big numbers. So, thank you, thank you, and thank you again for everybody checking that out and taking advantage of the sale. Also, the Patreon link is there. Shout out to all our amazing patrons. And I hope everybody read the blog post that was posted in there. Because everybody's got something special coming their way in May, uh, for the month of May, I should say. So you definitely want to go check that out if you're on the Patreon. And if you want to sign up for June and on forward from there, one tier, $2 a month, and a lot of fun stuff on the way. Also, the blog section is always going off on the page. You, you got the classified section, which has friends of the show, such as 3 of Fun Podcast, Dragon Master Games, the directory, which, Pat, how many providers are we on? Uh, 531,000. Sounds about right to me. The music section. Basically, if it's anything and everything that is the ODPH, you can find it on odphpodcast.com. And always remember on social media to use the hashtag ODPHpod. Kicking off this edition of the show, we have to recap the latest episode of our favorite show on the CW, and that is Superman and Lois. Hell yeah. Season three of the story of Smallville's first family has definitely not been a letdown by any stretch of the imagination. Tyler Hoechlin and Elizabeth Tolick are playing the title roles of Clark and Lois and their family's adventures moving from Metropolis to Smallville has never been short of excitement yet. Mm-hmm. And this season, there has been a lot of going on, and the teasing of Lex Luthor has been something that the show has not been shying away of. No. But we have one villain by the name of Bruno Mannheim, played by Chad L. Coleman, who has done a fantastic job this season, really making his claim before Lex gets in town about who is the biggest bad in the Superman universe on the CW show. So that said, we are going to be recapping the latest episode entitled Collision Course. Now, if you're new to the ODPH, first and foremost, thank you for checking us out. We really do appreciate it. What we like to do is give a spoiler-free statement about the show. So if you haven't seen it yet, don't worry. We're going to give you our opinions of it. Then you can go watch the show and then jump back in because once we give a countdown, it's officially on for spoilers. We deep dive. We don't hold anything back. You have been forewarned. And in the liner notes of the show, Pat always timestamps when we go into spoiler talk. So there's no reason we spoil anything for you. So that said, Pad, give me your spoiler-free statement about Collision Course. Uh, episode was good. Thought it, well, enjoyed it a lot. And enjoyed kind of like the build-off they've been doing from this season into, well, from the fir- first half of the season, I guess you could say, uh, into where they're going. Uh, the name dropping of Lex Luthor continues, and it's going to be real interesting to see where when he shows up because, boy, he's going to come out like a bat out of hell. Um, but no, enjoyed the episode. I thought it was a good episode. I think we had a lot of storylines going on that I think are going to pay off dividends down the road. I think the one they focused a lot on this episode really didn't do a lot for me, Mm -hmm. but I understand why they did it because, like I say, this is all leading to something. Right. What I don't know, but the story of Smallville's newest superhero... (sighs) Like it's it's growing on me, mm-hmm. but I wasn't completely wowed by it. I mean, I've I've gotten I've enjoyed it because it reminds me a little bit of some of the uh, early middle seasons of Smallville, mm-hmm. where Clark was developing his powers and he was trying to stay hidden. And you know, even to, even into the time when he showed up in Metropolis uh, in the later seasons of Smallville, where it was the Blur, 
you know, or the, the, the red blue blur, you know, or whatever else. Like it, it reminded me of that. So it reminded me of a much simpler time in my life. So, so the storyline with like, Oh, there's a new superhero in, in Smallville felt like a little bit of a callback, a little bit of an homage, if you will. I've enjoyed it for what it is. No, no, I can understand that you're a big Smallville fan. Yeah. So me, like I say, I love the beginning of this. I love the end of the show. Uh, the middle, like I take it or leave it. Yeah. There's, yeah. there's a certain things. I'm just like, okay, here we are again. But I understand why they did it, so I'm not mad about it. But it just kind of felt like almost a, a reset in, right. certain, in a certain degree. Right. So that said, let's talk some spoilers, shall we? So in three, two, one, talk to me. Thought the episode was good. Thought it took a little long in certain spots to play out. You know, especially with the Pia stuff. You know, the Pia stuff seemed to drag out a little bit. You know, I figured it would. You know, you would have gotten the. I don't want to say resolution, but like you know, the fall. If we're talking like English literature. You know, with the rising action, the falling action and all that kind of stuff. If you remember back from school, Mm -hmm. I figure we would have gotten the falling action into like the conclusion a little sooner than we did. You know, that's not to say it was a bad thing. It's just I felt like they were dragging it out in certain point at certain points. Some stuff was telegraphed, you know, uh, especially the scenes where where uh, Bruno gave his son Matteo the cufflinks, which which we'll get it. That was telegraphed as fuck. Um, But no, the episode was good. I enjoyed it. I love the Pia stuff. Yeah. I really enjoyed that. And you know what? I agree with you. It was telegraphed about Mateo yeah. with the cufflink. Yeah. As soon as dad goes, come here, son. I got something for you. Yep. And he pulls him out of the box. I was watching with my girlfriend, Liz Ben. And I'm like, yeah, those are gimmicked in some way. Yeah. They're, I'm like, there's a track. She's like, what do you mean? I'm like, there's a tracking device. There's some sort of EMP, EMP you know, emitter in those things. They, there's, you know, some sort of sonic emitter to like shatter everyone's eardrums. I go, those are not ordinary cufflinks. Yeah. And I didn't mind that at all. Because I think this was a natural progression for Mateo's character. Oh, yeah. So I wasn't mad about it. But I do agree with you. It was telegraphed, but it did play out as I thought it was going to. Mm -hmm. And I thought it gave a little balance to the other storyline going on, which is who is the real Superman, I guess we can call it. Well, the real Superman, please stand up. Yeah. Please stand up. Because obviously this season, Alex Garfin's Jordan Kent has been focusing on his emergence as a superhero. A little bit of a metamorphosis. Yeah, you can say that. Yeah. And I think this episode, they're really deep diving into what it's going to be all about. So they mm. gave him a lot of screen time with it, Yeah. which I didn't mind. The only thing that I'm like rolling my eyes at yet again is the whole back and forth with him and Sarah. Yeah. Which is just like at the stage. It's like they forgot about it for a couple of weeks and then in the writer's room they were like, oh, right, we're supposed to be doing that whole storyline. Yeah. But before we start with that, this episode kicks off with Lois finishing her chemotherapy. Hell yeah. Yeah. Awesome scene. You see her ring the bell, screw cancer. It was a really strong scene. I really loved how they kicked things off with that. And then... Lois seems to go back to business, and the one case that she's been talking about this entire season mm-hmm. as her holy grail case, her her you know fountain of youth case, mm-hmm. whatever you wanted to find it, the dream case is proving that Bruno Mannheim is the villain that we all know he is. She wants to get this guy dead to rights and get him in jail, mm-hmm. and it's become like this you know, like obsession, obsession at this case or this point, because she's refusing to let anything stop her. Like she feels that she's never been closer to proving him as the evil tyrant of intergang that we all know him. She has an internal struggle through multiple episodes. The last couple episodes with whether she should press Pia Mm -hmm. because she's got this friendship with Pia, this person she connects with on a, on a different level because of what they both went through. Mm hmm. You know, but then also, hey, your new friend is also married to the guy you've been trying to, you know, nail f- nail to the wall for however many years. So it's do you risk your friendship or do you go for your dream goal? Mm-hmm. And she does use her poll with her dad being the head of the DOD yeah. to go see Pia, who has been held in custody since she was getting medical treatment for her last battle with Superman and John Henry Irons a few mm-hmm. episodes back. So she's been isolated from Bruno and Mateo, and she's been on the DOD's watchful eye. Medical supervision, because yeah. we find out this up from in this episode. It was I think it was kind of hinted at, but it's kind of confirmed from uh, General Lane that like she uh, she doesn't have long. Right. So Lois goes to see her and is 
trying everything she can to get Pia to confess to being the responsible party for the crimes Lex Luthor was committed for Mm -hmm. in jail. Because as this show has alluded to, Luthor has been in jail for quite some time. They haven't given a specific year. I think the only thing that's been inferred is it's been a couple decades. Yeah, I want to say I thought they said 20 years. Something like that, yeah. And you see that Pia is sitting there and basically denying this as much as she can. Well, she starts telling like the truth as she knows it. Mm-hmm. And she starts going this and that. And Lois is playing dumb for parts of it. Like, oh, I, oh, I don't know. I'm not, you know. This is the first time hearing of this. And then we get to the scene or the part of the story in the, in the dining room. Yeah. Or the, or the restaurant, I should say. And Pia goes, oh, yeah. And then Lex Luthor killed you know, uh, boss Moxie and, and Lois decides to play her hand and goes, well, I heard the confession tape. I don't think that was Lex. I think that was you. Mm. And it goes a little bit of a tense back and forth where Pia denies it. Lois tries to go, no, I really think it's you. And, and Pia goes essentially, you need to leave Yeah, and never come back. It's a great scene between Tolik and Dea Vidaya mm-hmm. who, they're back and forth. I mean, the, it shows the struggle of their friendship yeah. that they've had and with what they're trying to protect. I mean, Lois is trying to protect her integrity as a journalist and yeah. even as a human being because she can't handle the guilt that Lex Luthor is in jail because of something that she helped uh, orchestrate with what she's been writing about all these years. Right, and, and we even found out, just to call back a little bit to a little bit before in the episode, we found out that the Smallville Gazette ended up posting the article about Bruno Mannheim and his wife Mm -hmm. and and Lois feels guilty about it. Yeah. But Clark tries reasoning with her. Like, listen, we had a set level of expectations from what we wanted from him. And I'm paraphrasing. We wanted the set level of expectations of a, a, B and C we wanted from him and we wouldn't publish the article. He didn't meet those demands. Mm hmm. So it was a situation that her ethics are called into question, and especially now that she knows the truth that Mannheim is responsible for the killing Mm -hmm. of Boss Moxie. And she feels guilty. Yeah, she feels overwhelmingly guilty because, like I said, she's been obviously having a long history with Lex Luthor that we haven't even scratched the surface with on the show. Yeah. And then for Pia, she knows that, one, what this will do if she confesses. Mm -hmm. Her husband goes to jail. Mm -hmm. Her son grows up without his father. Yeah. She's not willing to sacrifice that. Plus, she says something, and I'm paraphrasing in this, Yeah. of you think he was bad when he was free? Oh, yeah. You're now going to unleash the devil onto the world. Yeah. Because what do you think he's been doing in jail? And she goes on to, I think she even ends that thing, that that sentence with, do you really want to unleash that evil on the world? Yeah. And I, to which I'm like, well, when you put it that way. And then the other thing, too, is she's in a P is in a real dilemma, because at this point in the story, you know, it would put her husband in jail. The son would be raised without his father. And at this point, she's going to die. Yeah. So this kid would literally go into the foster care system, which Lord knows what would happen with him at that point. Yeah. So, like I say, she understands the, the stakes of what she's going to say or not going to say. Mm hmm. And Lois is still trying to do the right thing in her mind. Yeah. And I, I love how they set this up as an ethical question. Mm-hmm. Because, yeah, are you doing the right thing, but is it for the greater good? Because it's it's multiple parts of Lois's personality tugging at the same time. It's her personality as a reporter, you know, wanting to do the right thing, print the right thing, say the right thing, you know, help get the... I don't know if right or wrong person, however you want to phrase it, getting, you know, the, the culpable person put behind bars, but at the same token, she's also a mother, you know, she's got kids of her own. So she, she feels for, for Pia with, Oh, he'd be without his father and you know, she's going to be gone soon. And and so it's, it's, it's a real conundrum. Yeah, absolutely. And like I said, I love the back and forth between them. Like I said, I thought this was one of the stronger parts of this episode. Absolutely. Yeah. Like I say, their, their story really took some time to build. But then they kind of switch things to Clark Mm -hmm. and his connection with his sons, Mm -hmm. Jonathan and Jordan. Yep. And it's been, I don't want to say rocky lately, Yeah. but they're they're teenagers. It's it's kind of that phase. They don't want to hang out with their dad so much. And when he wants to try spending time with them, they give a little bit of a lie to get out of it. 
to go to a party. Well, so Lois goes to see her dad at the DOD and goes, oh, you should do something with the boys. You haven't done something with them in a while. Mm-hmm. And he goes to approach them and they're like, oh, yeah, sure, whatever. Like, because they're in the middle of playing a video game. And neither of them really want to do it. And then they find out about the party and they're in. Uh, Jordan is like, well, we can't blow off dad. We said we would do it. And Jonathan goes, well, we dad does it to us all the time. We'll let him down easy. So Clark at this, while they're having this conversation has gone off to Metropolis because there's some pro wrestling event going on in Metropolis. I kind of got the feel off that it's like their equivalent of like a WrestleMania, Mm -hmm. you know, all out, all in type of thing. You know, and he comes back, he's like, yeah, I got tickets. I got tickets to whatever the event was called. You know, out in Metropolis, he bought it. I think he even bought a shirt. And they're like, yeah, that's great. Uh, Sorry, plans came up. We got to leave. Can I say how much I marked out when he mentioned he had wrestling tickets? I I loved it. Does he acknowledge Roman Reigns? Uh, One would have to think so. We might have to make a Twitter poll about this. I loved it. Like I said, the fact that he was marking out about going to wrestling, I'm like, this is... uh, not that I didn't already love his character enough, but Tyler Hoechlin's portrayal of Superman, just, oh, another level right there. Mm-hmm. But as we see Jonathan and Jordan go to this party. It's a senior party. Yes, the quote-unquote senior party. That at, some, at, at the old fairgrounds. Yep, somebody's acquired a keg of beer. Kegs. Yeah. And you see that Sarah is there. Well, that's how that's how Jordan gets talked into going because Jordan doesn't want to go because he feels guilty about blowing his dad off. And Jonathan says the magic words, Sarah will be there. Yeah. How do you know? She's the one who told me about the party. Yeah. So Sarah, though, is going with somebody else. Uh And that's George Jr., Uh the son of the former mayor of Smallville who was killed by Pia. Yep. Uh, and obviously the ties to Bruno Mannheim are stretching way outside Metropolis here. Yeah, they are. But you're seeing that Sarah and George had a bonding moment uh, at a dance a few episodes ago. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of a blossoming relationship here. Yep. So Jordan is sitting there and is trying to be the third wheel, and it's kind of an awkward moment. So he's not dealing with this well because he interrupts a conversation. Yeah. And like I say, we go back to the whole – Will they, won't they? Yeah, so it, it, it's like, I, at this stage, like, give them time to do something else. And sure. then if you want to come back, sure. But sure. I think I think at this stage, there's other storylines that I wish they would focus on more than them, such as Jonathan and Candace. Yeah. Which we get a quick moment because Candace is his, his girlfriend that had to move away from town. Because her father was a bit of a jerk. Yeah, who's now on the run right now. Yeah, she hasn't seen him in weeks, if not months, and... Uh, she go, and jo- Jonathan goes, oh, well, have you heard or seen you fr- from your father? And she goes, no, last I knew he was in Kansas City. Yeah, so I thought it was interesting that they dropped that. Yeah. It could be a throwaway line, or he could be coming back before the, uh, the season is all done. Yeah, maybe. I wouldn't doubt that, but I thought it was kind of interesting how they played off. But you seeing that she is trying to talk to Jonathan about what's happened, Jonathan... Uh-huh. Tips off about, well, the whole thing at the fire department has not been working well because Kyle. Well, doesn't she bring it up? She she effectively goes, well, how's the fire department thing going? Yeah. And he doesn't want to say because it would reveal part of telling the full story would re- involve revealing his bro- his brother has powers. Mm-hmm. So he has to be coy about it and go, eh, well, you know. Uh, Mr. Cushing doesn't want me around that much. Well, why? I thought you were super excited about it. Yeah, listen, can we not talk about this? Yeah. yeah. And she goes, yeah, sure, if that's what you want. Yeah. Which, oh, boy. Which, like I say, I, I love how they set it up because obviously the situation with George, with Jonathan and Kyle mm-hmm. has been very, very shaky lately. <laughs> very, very tense. Because Kyle is fully convinced that there is a super-powered individual in Smallville. Mm-hmm. And everyone he tells about this is... <laughs> Conveniently, everyone who knows about said superpowered person, if you noticed that in the episode, mm-hmm. and everyone's kind of like, no, we can't we can't do anything about this. This isn't true. Yeah. So Jonathan's been very careful about what he can say about it, but mm-hmm. it's obviously causing a problem for him because obviously he's not the superpowered son of uh, Superman at, at yep. the moment. Yeah. Not to say he's not going to develop powers at some point, but at this moment, he's trying to find his own place in his own identity. And he's struggling to do this. So I love how they were setting that up. I wish they spent more time with that. Sure. I understand why they didn't. But as you see, they they did devote a lot of time to the party. Mm-hmm. 
And it plays into when the police show up. Oh, yeah. You see Sarah and George make this escape, much like everybody else does, because when the police show up at the parties, everybody goes running. Yeah. Sarah and George escape in Sarah's car, Mm -hmm. and they drive away. It looks like there's an escape happening. With the lights off. And and, uh, George Jr. tells Sarah, drive with the lights off so they can't see you leaving. Yeah. And I'm sitting there watching this going, oh, this isn't going to play well. Oh, I, I exactly. Like, this is just complete setup for disaster. Yep. And as they drive off, she does escape, and she kind of looks away from the road. And then when she looks back, there's a deer there. After she she looks back towards the road and turns the lights back on, and up oh, there's a deer. Yeah. So she makes a swerve, and she causes an accident. The car starts to flip, yeah. Yeah, which the CGI for this accident... Very good. Very, very good. Yeah. And I and the one thing about it is you never saw Jordan fly in to grab them. Well, you didn't see him in person. There was a, a brief blur. Yeah, but I love how they set that up. Yeah. Like I say, you yeah. didn't you didn't see like the slow motion flash, no. you know, no. running the stop time and, yeah. and go in there. Yeah. So Jordan winds up saving them. Mm-hmm. And you see that... So much for laying low. Yeah, because he's promised he was going to lay low because he knew he was getting Jonathan in trouble. So when As soon as he said the line, I think the thing was like an episode or two ago, was watching with my girlfriend and I said, yeah, we'll see how long that lasts. Mm-hmm. About two weeks. So he winds up flying away. George sees him. Mm-hmm. Well, and, he sees a figure. Right, he sees a figure. And he's trying to tell Sarah that he saw somebody and Sarah's trying to brush off because she knows the truth. She, yeah. So their story winds up crashing into... Lana's story mm-hmm. and Amal Kirky playing the, t- you know, Lana Lang, the mayor of Smallville, is now meeting with the governor of Kansas. Yeah, because of everything that's happened in that one week in Kansas, she came to survey the damage. Yes. So they're having a very pr- high profile political meeting mm-hmm. because Chrissy is reporting on this. Yeah. And like I say, and at this point, Kyle has gone to Chrissy and showed her the evidence mm-hmm. about the about John or Jordan having powers. And and Chrissy goes, well, this isn't enough evidence. I can't print this. She wants to warn Lana about what's going on because Lana knows. Yeah. And Lana brushes it off as like, listen, I'm divorced from that mess. I'm not going to solve your problems with my ex-husband. Mm-hmm. And she's like, no, it's about the governor shows up. And as Lana walks away, Chrissy goes, a secret. Yeah. And like I say, Chrissy is trying to do her best. Sophie Hammocks uh, was doing a great job in this role, too. Yeah. And you see that Lana gets called away by Kyle. Yep. And you find out Sarah's been arrested for DUI. Yeah. The governor, who is sitting there rooting on Lana for leaving uh, or signing the divorce and how much stronger yeah. she'll be from it. Also, shit-talking the... I forget the exact phrase she used, but the governor insulted whatever woman, you know, her ex-husband's with now. Yeah. While the woman her ex-husband is with is standing right next to them. Boy, that was awkward. Yeah. Sophie Hamzik. Just the the facial expressions she was doing during this scene Mm -hmm. is priceless. I mean, but it plays to the character. But you see that Lana's called away now and is talking with Kyle because obviously Sarah's been charged with a DUI. Mm -hmm. She has to leave the dinner. Yeah. with the governor and that kind of leaves things a little uneasy because it looked like they were you know really connecting and really trying to yeah. figure out how to improve Smallville and do some things there. Yeah, cuz Lana did say at one point in the episode that she's got bigger aspirations than just mayor that maybe she could be a state senator, maybe even a congresswoman. Yeah. But obviously this is really throwing everything out of whack. Yeah. And leading to Kyle asking more questions about mm-hmm. the incident. And really try and drive home the point that George did reveal that, well, somebody saved us. Yeah, and, and the sheriff, he had told this to the sheriff, and the sheriff is brushing it off. Mm. But Kyle, knowing what he knows, is like, wait a minute, what did you see? Yeah. And George Jr. tells him what he saw. He looks at Sarah and goes, did you see this? And Sarah kind of pauses for just a brief second and goes, no, no, I didn't see anything. Yeah, so it's now heightened Kyle's questions he's already had. Mm-hmm. That he's putting together the diagram and he's seeing the picture. Yeah. So that is going to come to play a little later, Mm -hmm. but then we shift back to Pia's story Mm -hmm. and Mateo finally visits her. Yep. And it's an interesting setup because obviously if she's working and she was talking about the confession, she was allowed to see. Yep. uh, Mateo. Yep. But as we talked about, Bruno Mannheim gives Mateo an object, Uh, two cufflinks. Yes. To give to Pia. Mm hmm. And as he goes to see his mom, he holds her hand. Because she asked for her hands to be released so she could hug her son. Yes. And when this happens, 
Mateo activates the cufflinks. Well, because, and she gets nervous because I'm sorry, I need to tell you some things. She's like, I need to explain why things happened the way they did. Right. And he goes, well, no, don't worry about it, mom. I already know. What do you mean you already know? No, dad told me everything. And he's got this like maniacal grin on his face that kind of made my skin crawl a little bit. I'm like, hey, yikes, this kid's already, you know, three feet, three foot steps down the evil dark path here. You know, but then he goes, oh, no, don't worry, mom. Dad told me this is going to help you. Yeah. You know, he t- he, the blood is going to help you. Well, when it's explained to him that this could save your mother's life, uh huh, it's a little more easy to process that Bruno's reasons for doing what he's doing mm-hmm. are justified in his mind. Because you know what? It, it goes back to the ethical question as well. Sure. And like I say, I really like how they wrote this because you could understand why Mateo turned as quick as he did. Oh, absolutely. Little telegraph, but under the circumstances, who wouldn't? Mm-hmm. Sorry. Like, yeah. that's that's the honest truth. So as you see, she's now injected with the Superman cure. Mm-hmm. Well, so whatever it is. Well, yeah, like I say. Cause they, they don't. It, what is it? Reasons. Reasons. They don't go into specifics. Exactly. Just something with Bizarro Superman's something. Yeah, helped, helped heal her. Yeah, there is there is some kind of concoction that is injected into her. It's a hell of a cocktail. Yeah, so you see her just emerge. Like well, yeah, she just gets all sorts of healthy. You yeah, know, her skin doesn't look. She looks a hundred percent healthy. Yeah. So now with her powers back. Yeah. She's basically got Lois trapped with her. Right, because Mateo leaves. Yep. Lois comes back in and goes, all right, I let you see your kid. Time to hold up your end of the bargain. Yep. Time, time to spill all the details. And and Pia just says, yeah. <laughs> yeah, about that. Yeah. I've, uh, to quote Darth Vader, I've altered the plans. Pray I don't alter them any further. Yes. So Pia leads this crazy escape. Yeah. And she's trashing the DOD on the way out the door. Yeah. Yeah. So they're going to shoot. They're going to send any of the bill. Mm-hmm. So Pia winds up escaping, right? They, well, she gets to a door, wants Lois to open it. And Lois is like, I can't open it. I can't. I open it. I can't. I don't have access. And she goes, fine. And Lois says, you realize if you open that door or you blow open that door, every alarm in this building will go off and Superman will be here almost instantaneously. Mm-hmm. And she's like, yep, don't care. Yeah. She's waiting on it. So it's a very unique circumstance of how she escapes, but she definitely leaves a a trail behind. Question for you. At this point, we already knew what was going on. Mm -hmm. Like she had taken out General Lane because she shattered the window. He was the the two to one way mirror she was looking through, whatever it is. Why were there not like 50 to 100 people with weapons pointed at that door waiting? The only reason I came up with great question, by the way is when she initiated the blast yeah. to get out yeah. and she hit the one on General Lane 2. Because after the, she hits General Lane, she's going down the hallway knocking out all the cameras. Right. So it's not exactly secret what's going on. Right. But I think when she originally escaped, she short-circuited everything. Mm, that could be. That's the only way I, could, I came up with it. Because that confused me because I'm like, all right, she took out General Lane. She's taking out all the security cameras. They... She asks Lois what's on the other side of the door. Lois tells her that there's people there, mm-hmm. and they go to show the other side of the door before she blows it open, and they're just ho-hum sitting there going about their day. Yeah. That's the only thing I came up with is she sort of circuited the alarms getting out yeah. and bought some time. Because by the time she gets the rest of the DOD, she's unloading her powers on everybody and taking yeah. out everything in the room. So. Like I say, it's a powerful way to say she's back and she's ready for that next fight against Superman. Mm -hmm. So, like I say, she makes the escape. And then they kind of shift things back to the Kents. Mm -hmm. And obviously, with what has transpired, Clark... He's a little angry. He's a little angry to find out what's happened. Jonathan gets back first. He's He tries to take his keys away instantly. Mm -hmm. And Jonathan goes, I haven't been drinking. Well, you were at a party. Yeah. No, Jordan was back first, actually. Oh, no. Yeah, you're right. But he he confronts Jonathan first. Yes. He confronts Jonathan because he hears Jonathan's truck pull up. He goes, you were drinking and driving. No, I wasn't. You were at a party with alcohol. Yes, I was. And I had water. And he goes, Dad, you have super you you have superpowers. You'd be able to sense the alcohol on me. And the, and I think for an instance, Clark did kind of do the do a little smell test and went, okay, yeah, you're right. And he goes, well, your brother was drinking. And and this is a great line from Jonathan. He goes, okay, and you want to punish me for what he's done wrong? 
The best character written on this show is Jonathan Kent. Man, week in and week out. And Michael Bishop, man, give credit where credit's due. The, Step- the way he delivered that line was awesome. Yeah. You want to, okay, and you want to punish me for what he did? Oh, my God, man. That kid is crushing this role. And you see, yeah, just that back and forth with him and uh, Superman, perfect. Because mm-hmm. you see Garfin takes off because when he gets called out about it, because he's freaking out because he saved, he's saved Sarah and, yeah. and George, but revealed his identity, which Clark is okay with. Yeah. But he's not happy you went to a party and you blew him off. And I wouldn't be either if you blew me off and made me miss WrestleMania. <laughs> I'd be a little angry about that too. <laughs> President used a heat vision on those kids. I, anyway, I digress. But – you see, though, this is also the fatherly bond that he's he understands what happened. He's yeah. try, but he has to be the dad, and he, he's trying to ground him. And he's telling Lois, you know, uh, what's going to happen. But this is also he can't really get through because of what's going on now at the DoD. Well, Kyle shows up, and all of a sudden, Kyle's like, "I put it all together. I figured it all out." And Clark is like, "What are you talking about? Jonathan has powers. What?" And because uh, like he starts talking, and I was like, "How the hell did he get to this conclusion?" You know, based off of the limited information he has, but then he starts explaining it and he explains everything that's happened on at Smallville, you know, the fires and the this and the that. And, he, and well, this all really only started when your family showed up. So I've got to figure Jonathan's got powers. Yeah. I want to talk to Jonathan. And so they're both in the house up in the bedroom, one of the bedrooms. And Jonathan says to Jordan, what is he saying? And Jordan, who can hear him, goes, he thinks you have powers. Mm-hmm. So they go down and and. Kyle wants to get past Clark and confront them. And at this point, Clark hears the commotion going on at the DOD. Yeah. Wants to leave, but can't because he's going to something. Something's going to happen with his kids and, and, and Kyle, and he's not entirely thrilled about it. So Kyle goes, it's one of the, it's either the first or second time Kyle goes to go past second him. time. Second time he goes past him. Clark stops him with two fingers. Yep. And Kyle just looks at him and goes, what the fuck was that? Yeah. And so finally Clark can't, you know, with Jonathan and Jordan standing there, Kyle, he looks at Kyle and goes, Kyle, I'm sorry. I'll explain it all to you tomorrow. And he takes off in flight right in front of him. Yep. Perfect way. Because like I say, he was on the phone before when he was talking to Lois. Yep. But once he's off the phone, this is when Kyle shows up and he has to confront. Well, he, he tried calling Lois, but it went to voicemail. Right. Like I say, it's just an interesting setup how they did this. But now he has revealed himself mm-hmm. to Kyle. Yep. And that's going to raise a lot of questions moving forward. Oh, yeah. But that's not exactly how things end because you have the family reunion of the Mannheims. Yeah. Down in the Frankenstein dungeon. Can we just call it that? Effectively, yes. Yeah, where they meet up, everybody's reunited, and now it's setting up for the final confrontation between Bruno Mannheim and Superman. Mm -hmm. And we still have Bizarro Superman still on the operating table whatever you want to call it he's in the gurney yeah and that's how this the show ends yeah man a lot of good stuff happening here um pat i mean final thoughts on the episode great episode excited to see where they go next week especially you know with the one line uh john henry iron's daughter in the preview preview says oh you know listen it's not his fault he did something wrong i go well it's not it's not exactly that when it's a choice yeah you know but the next week's episode uh which i looked is titled complications is gonna be something super excited to see it this episode was awesome though yeah i have to agree like i say when you're focusing on the Mannheim's dynamic i love when they are on screen Mm -hmm. and especially the back and forth between pia and lois i think that's one of the strongest stories they've had all year and just how this ends. I mean, this is, it's, it's tragic in a sense because their friendship was some, something that was great to see, but ultimately you knew Lois was going to be pressuring about taking down Bruno Mannheim like this. And it goes back to the ethical questions that we talked about earlier with this. And especially now with Superman revealing his identity yet again to somebody in Smallville. I mean, it's kind of almost become a running joke mm-hmm. at this stage, but still it's going to pay off big dividends. And then now it's leading into that final confrontation. I'm super excited about next week's episode because I do love it when the Irons family is on this show. I think yes. they just add such a, an awesome dynamic to it. And like I say, with Wooly Parks and Taylor Buck on next week, I'm all in for it. But this episode, very solid for what it was. Take away the party and just how much they spent on the whole we've been here before with Sarah and Jordan. If they take that out, this is almost like a perfect episode. Yeah, I mean, I understood. I understood the 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 nice thing with the Jordan and the Sarah thing is they didn't dwell on it super long. Yeah, so that was that was a benefit. Yeah, I agree. Like, but I just think it's like you've already played it out too long. Yeah, and yeah, you, no, I agree. Yeah, you have to give Jordan 
something else to do. I groaned when it's when the whole plot line brought up got brought up again this week, but once it kind of ended quickly, I was like, okay, at least they're not dwelling. Yeah. Well, hopefully it doesn't carry over to next week because otherwise that'd be more complication that we need. Yeah, that's true. See what I did there? Mm-hmm. But in the meantime, folks, hashtag ODPHPod, what is your thoughts about Collision Course, episode 10 of season three of the CW and DC Comics, Superman and Lois? Let's discuss, shall we? We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Hi, and welcome to The Capsule Life, a show for the most casual and dedicated fans of comics and a member of the Comic Watch family. I'm your host, Sean. Join me and discover what the world of comics and graphic novels have to offer. From one-on-one interviews with industry professionals, roundtable discussions with passionate fans, and reviews on the latest comics, TV shows, and movies. You can also check out our website, www.thecaptionlife.com, to find out where you can listen to us, a list of all of our episodes, and where you can find us on social media under the user name at caption life you'll get a new episode from us every week so hit the subscribe button so you don't miss out coming back for another segment on this edition of the odph podcast and this is a big week for spider-man yes it is so there is a lot of news breaking good bad and otherwise yes so let's talk about some good news that just got announced as we're hitting the airwaves pad so we got some live action Miles Morales. Yeah. So it filed this under like the least surprising news of the week, because if you're surprised by the fact that this got announced, you haven't been paying attention. Uh, so reading from an article on variety.com where the headline reads Spider-Man producers tease live action Miles Morales movie and animated spider woman film quote. It's all happening. Uh, which the article goes on to say, quote, as Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse finally hits theaters this weekend, the producers behind the trilogy have their attention set on the third installment next year's Beyond the Spider-Verse. However, that's not the only web-slinging project that's on their minds. Producer Amy Pascal says a Spider-Woman in live-action Miles Morales movie are in the works. Quote, you'll see all of it, she told me Tuesday at the Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse premiere in Los Angeles. It's all happening. Producer Avi Arad teased that moviegoers will see a Spider-Woman movie sooner than you expect. Quote, I cannot tell you yet, but it's coming, he said. Pascal also said a fourth Spider-Man movie with Tom Holland and Zendaya is still in the works, but the writer's strike has paused development. Are we going to make another movie? Of course we are, she said. We're in the process, but the writer's strike, nobody is working during the strike. We're all being supporters, and whenever they get themselves together, we'll get it we'll get started. Close quote. Sony boss Tom Rothman was much more cagey about the future. He laughed, if I told you, I'd have to kill you, close quote. Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse sees the return of Shamik Moore as Miles Morales and Haley Steinfeld as Gwen Stacy. It sure sounds like Steinfeld is up for a standalone Spider-Woman movie. Quote, this is like my dream job. Sign me up over and over again, she said about doing voice work. I got to be, com- I got to be comfortable, and it's a dream to be in a space that feels so comfortable, but also creative and free and just exciting to be a part of. Close quote. Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, directed by Joaquin Dos Santos, Justin K. Thompson, and Kemp Powers, is in theaters Friday, June 2nd, and the cast also includes Issa Rae, Daniel Kalua, Jason Schwartzman, Brian T- Tyree Henry, Lauren uh, Luna, excuse me, Lauren Vel- uh, Velez, Rachel Dratch, Shea Wingham, Leland Metro Boomin Wayne, Ziggy Marley, Ao Edebiri, and Daniel Perez, close quote. So, first and foremost, awesome news to hear. Mm-hmm. Not super surprised by this at all. I mean, no. They've been wanting to do a Miles Morales movie since, like, the character boomed onto the comic pages way back when. 2011, to yeah. be honest. Yeah. Coming out of the Ultimates universe, which yeah. is now having a resurgence in Marvel Comics later this year. Fuck yeah. So, this is a perfect time to do the announcement. and yeah. And it's not one that we as fans are super shocked at. No. Miles Morales has been one of the most popular characters in all of comics since he debuted. Mm-hmm. And rightfully so. Fantastic character. Yeah. And especially getting this high-profile spotlight on him is just all it's all win 
Mm-hmm. All win every day. I mean, they're, let's face it. They're making as many spider character movies as they can. There's a Madam Web movie supposedly on the way. Allegedly. Allegedly. You know, the Spider-Man 4 with uh, Tom Holland. Okay, no shit. Like, again, least surprising news of the day. Yeah, and he's been very vocal, too. He wanted to see Miles Morales get introduced. Mm-hmm. And I know that that was the context of his uh, how long would he play Spider-Man for and when right. when that was first announced because he said, and he goes, no, Miles Morales should get his time on the screen. Right, and we got to remember his uncle was introduced in the second one, first one? Yes. Whichever one it was. So this is a real no surprise here. I was kind of surprised at the Spider-Woman spinoff for the animated. Uh, I'm not. I mean, if it, if it, with it being the character from the animated movies, as popular as she is, you know, with cosplays, she, she, she the character of Spider-Woman was already popular enough as is and was very popular to begin with. I feel like the portrayal by uh, portrayal by Haley Steinfeld and just the, the way it's done in the movie has just elevated that character so much further than what you would have expected because the diehard Spider-Man readers, obviously, yeah, like if you go men, men, mention your top we'll say 10 uh, Spider-Man characters. Spider-Woman's going to be in there for most people, I would imagine. But just the the, the boom and, and surge in popularity of that character ties back to this movie. Well, the only reason I say it's kind of surprising is we haven't gotten to the end of the trilogy. Sure. And I think to announce it ahead of time, not to say that something was going to happen to the character mm-hmm. in the film that is coming out this week. Right. I just thought it was kind of an interesting way to play it, especially because we know her as Ghost Spider. Right. Because there has uh, been a, a variety of characters that played Spider-Woman um, in both the comics and in the animated series. So that being said, I mean, it is when, because Haley Steinfeld has done an amazing job with this, when the original animated film came out. Yeah. And just really made this whole franchise into such a big bucket of win. Like I say, when we have to sit here and think about the first movie that came out in this franchise, Mm -hmm. 2018's Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, and to see this universe now explode like this Mm -hmm. is just really an amazing feat to see because we always talk about DC animation has been very, very... DC's been king for like three decades. Yeah, to put it mildly. And now Marvel's is catching up, and especially for them to have a hit franchise Mm -hmm. animated series on the big screen is just another big win for them. Yeah. And especially you get to introduce characters of the Mm Spider-Verse to the pop culture audience that if they're not reading the comics for whatever reason, this is a great introduction piece. And to see how Ghost Spider has taken off, to see the movie get announced, like I say, not super surprised, but the timing surprises I me think a little bit. I think it's also a good way to just freshen up the palette for, for folks, like you said, who don't read the comics for whatever reason, to show that, hey, there's more to the Spider-Man mythos than just Peter Parker. Mm-hmm. Peter Parker, Mary Jane, whatever incarnation you want to go with, you know, there's more to the story than just, hey, it's a kid who gets bit by a radioactive spider, Uncle Ben gets shot, great power, great responsibility, and off we go. Mm-hmm. That there's more to it. There's other characters. There's a Spider-Woman. There's a, there's, you know, you can, the list goes on and on and on that like I, th- I think it's good because you think about it we saw uncle ben get killed twice mm-hmm. you know and when it came time for the third iteration with with tom holland we went all right f- a lot of folks myself included were going fuck are we about to see the same get the same guy get killed on screen again for like the third time in two decades mm-hmm. you know so like, like i said it's it's a nice palette enhancer oh absolutely like i say turning things over from peter parker to miles morales is a big win and it makes sense because of just how popular the character is. And now to see him get his own second feature film, albeit animation, but still to see him expand on this franchise mm-hmm. and how massive the 2018 film was as a hit. I mean, I remember yeah. when we were at New York Comic Con. Oh, yeah. And they played it for a panel and they played they the pulled first, first 30 minutes. Yeah. Like, how insane that was. We we weren't able to go to that panel because it was up at Madison Square Garden. Mm-hmm. And we're like, there's no... And, and we knew how packed and jammed it was going to be for that. And this is before we were there for press. Um, so we were like, there, we're like, there's no way we're going to be able to get into this. So we went to something else. Yeah. And we got out of whatever other panel we were in. And, we, and you were, I remember, looking... Or we were getting ready to go into the panel. And you were looking on your phone at, at Twitter and went, oh my God, they showed the first 30 minutes of Into the Spider-Verse. And I remember our reaction was, well, fuck, that can't be good if they're showing that much of the movie. Right, and how wrong were we? Very wrong. We've owned up to that numerous times because 2018 Into the Spider-Verse is just a fantastic film. Academy Award-winning film. Yeah, and rightfully so. 
And you really see the essence of Spider-Man just pour out. Yeah. And you understand why it connects with so many people and why Spider-Man is such a popular character. And like I say, it doesn't matter if it's Peter Parker or Miles Morales. It it still represents the everyday superhero. Like, you're not talking Superman who's invulnerable to everything. You're not talking about Batman where you get enough prep time. Mm -hmm. You can go fight the world because you got a bankroll that will help you do it. Spider-Man just connects with everybody because it's just the will of doing good. And with great power comes great responsibility. And like Mm -hmm. I say, Peter has had it. Miles has it. Gwen has it. I'll be at the Gwen Stacy of the alternate universe, not the one that's in the 616. Right. Because that's a, that's, yeah, she's, she's not. It's a whole, it's a whole other story. Yeah. Everybody knows I'm team MJ anyway. So like I say, when, when we talk about uh, Peter's best girlfriend, I always side with MJ. I digress because we have to go in. This is all leading into what is coming out this week at the box office. Yeah. And there's a certain sequel that we have alluded to, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. Yeah, which is going to be two and a half hours? Yes. Something like that? Which, originally hearing that screen time... That's fucking long. It, it, yeah, it's it's like, wow. Let, like, me, let me check my Regal app here. Uh, bu- bu- bu. We'll see. I'm doing this live, folks. Uh, let's see. For Thursday, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. Uh, the Regal app is listing it as two hours and 16 minutes. Yes. Which is long. For, oh. for an, a kid's animated movie? Let's face it. It's a kid's animated movie. That's fucking long. But, you know, it's not really meant for, for kids. Like, that's right. the one thing about that. Like, right. this, this is one that just crosses all boundaries and makes it, like, all ages. Like I say, when you have a film that connects with, you know, longtime comic readers. Uh, a la Mario. Yeah. you It really is makes it into a special event. And to see that this franchise has now expanded off that buzz. Yeah. We knew at the end of Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse that Miguel O'Hara was making his debut. We we knew he was going to show up in some fashion. Right. And that's the Spider-Man of 2099. Right. Everybody got really excited because you have a new Spider-Man that's coming onto the screen. To my and to my knowledge and admittedly the outside outside of the comics, I don't think has been featured that much outside of maybe a couple video games. I, yeah, I don't think he's had a, a super high profile. Right. But he has a cult-like status oh, amongst yeah. comic readers. Like oh, people, yeah. People love reading about him. He's a great character, too. I mean, most recently in Alex Segura's book with Aranya, uh, Dark Tomorrow, which, right. is, which is out on the shelves now. You should go pick it up. We did a review for it on ODPH Parlay Points. Definitely go check that out. But to see Miguel is now featured in this film, and we really don't know what his role is because according to the trailers, it seems he's more villain than hero. Well, that or there's something going on with the Miles Morales of this movie that's really pissed him off. Yeah, something has happened, and now the only thing that we've been able to really pick up from this trailer mm-hmm. is, or the trailers we've seen is, he's, Miles Morales somehow gets tied into the multiverse. Right. And obviously, that is the big thing going on in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Mm -hmm. But this is their version of doing it in the animated universe. And when he goes through to a central hub of spider people, he does meet the many versions of Spider-Man throughout the multiverse. Let's say we know Ben Riley's going to be there. Unfortunately. Uh, We know Spectacular Spider-Man from the uh, animated series in the early to mid-2000s is going to be in there. Mm -hmm. The Spider-Man from the PlayStation video game is going to be there, among a whole host of others. Yes. So this is going to be interesting to see how the dynamic deals, and especially with the villain being the Spot, Mm -hmm. who has always been a C to D list villain at best. Well, His superpower, folks, is he can throw spots onto objects. And then reach through them to the other side where he's put in another spot and steal things. Yes. So the it, fact it's, it's on the level of like Batrock. Yeah. But it, but in the fact that it's now made a transition that he look he appears to be the big bad of this film. It's really interesting to see what the story is going to be all about. Because the only thing we know is Miles appears to be a time anomaly. Right. He's not supposed to be involved in the Spider Verse, but yet here he is. So now. With this going on, and especially seeing how Miguel O'Hara is just so really determined to keep Miles away from joining the other Spider team. Right. It's an interesting dynamic that, like I say, it's going to throw some people off. I don't see. I don't think Spot is going to be the villain. I think that's just the one they're featuring in the trailers because, hey, logically, in a superhero movie, there has to be a villain. Mm -hmm. You know, it wouldn't make a lot of sense to show a Spider-Man movie or a Superman movie or a pick your superhero movie. And just has to say, hey, they're going off to face 
they're going off into this like in between the multiverse dimension and type thing. And they're just going to fight each other. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, I think it's a case of like, okay, we have to show a a villain of the movie just logically. So it fits for fans. I don't think it's going to be the, I, I, it's kind of like with the justice league movie where like, okay, you're not uniting the entire justice league at that point to fight Lex Luthor. Mm -hmm. Like you're not uniting, you know, the league of spiders or whatever you want to call it to fight the spot. Mm -hmm. Like, I I think it's just part of the story. It definitely will be, but where it's going to go is anybody's guess. Mm -hmm. Like the only thing we know after this is there's one more film to complete the trilogy right beyond the spider verse. After that, the franchise is going to go into a different direction. Like I say, with the announcement of the, well, at least the rumors of a spider woman spinoff. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that we're going to get another spider man, movie as well to just probably won't have anything to do with the spider verse right i think there's just a lot to be enjoying about this franchise and especially with the trailers and seeing how everything's come about it looks amazing Mm -hmm. and like i say it's something that visually will catch your attention i don't think we've seen anything like this for as far as animation goes no it's very unique yeah it just has a, a unique feel of vibe and energy to it that is really connecting with fans and really giving people that want to see something different out of spider man just a whole different universe Mm-hmm. something to really savor at. And I think that that's always interesting when you can pull that off for a character <laughs> that's been around for as long as he has. Yeah. To really reinvent him and really present it to the pop culture audience, I think is just nothing but win. Mm-hmm. So definitely super excited to check this movie out when it drops this week. I know I'm going open tonight. Pat is going to be there eventually. To yeah, see I'll get this. there at some point. Yes. And we'll definitely have a lot to talk about on next week's episode. But in the meantime... This movie is generating so much buzz. People, the early critic reviews are saying this is the greatest animated film of all time. Last I heard on Rotten Tomatoes, it had a 92% on the critic score. I will check right now. Yeah, it's definitely up there. And you have to think that with the buzz coming out of this, the expectation levels are super high. And they are rightfully so because of how well the first movie did. And to see that this is the middle of the franchise... So I'm expecting maybe a cliffhanger ending of some sort. As of this recording, uh, and this is the, as fresh as I can get on the page, uh, no pun intended, uh, with 86 reviews in on Rotten Tomatoes, it has a 94%. That's awesome. I'm super excited about that. I, like I say, this is just going to be one film that is really going to ignite a fan base that really wants a big Spider-Man win going on right now. And obviously with what's going on in the comics, uh, they could definitely use that, in yeah, my opinion. Yeah, well, the last thing with the movies, I know the imba- the social media embargo got lifted for what people thought of the movie who have already seen it. I have yet to see a bad thing about that movie. Yeah, I think it's been majority positive that yes. I've seen. I've seen a couple really picky reviews. Mm-hmm, sure. But I... I also get to the point when I see reviews like that, I think they just do it for clickbaits. Eh, That's just my opinion. Yeah. Because when something is so universally received like this, I think that the general vibe is this is really something special. And this is something that we definitely want to go out and see as fans. Go support them. We're going to all have something to talk about it this weekend after we go see it. And like I kind of alluded to, it kind of will offset some of the other big Spider-Man news that happened this week. (laughs) Because as we have alluded to... Amazing Spider-Man 26 by Marvel Comics Mm -hmm. has definitely raised some eyebrows, to put it mildly. Made headlines three weeks ago, two weeks ago, Mm -hmm. whatever it was. When spoilers were revealed about the Zeb Wells and John Romita Jr. book and the major death that Marvel has been hyping up that was going to be the most controversial book in Spider-Man in recent, in Spider-Man history in recent times. Yeah. Fans really didn't know what to expect. They set a lot of expectations. Mm -hmm. And it was revealed, so I don't feel this is a spoiler, but it has been well noted that Kamala Khan, a.k.a. Miss Marvel, is killed off in this book. Yep. Now, the story has been very polarizing amongst fans. I know Pat is actually one of the few that has actually enjoyed the story. No, no. Oh, okay. I'm mixed on it. I'm like, eh. You know, wait and see how it ends before I pass judgment. But right now I'm 50-50. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I'm I'm not sitting here going, this is the greatest story of all time. I'm not thoroughly enjoying it. I'm not rereading it. You know, so I wouldn't say I like it. I'm 50-50. Okay, that's fair. I, I couldn't really tell it because I know that you've been one. Of the, I, should, I guess I should rephrase that. You've been one that has said actually more open things to it yeah i'm I'm of the opinion let's hold out and see how it ends before we pass judgment on it you know 
let's see how the uh, see how the story ends before we make judgment on it. Am I enjoying it? No. Am I willing to change my opinion before, when I see the ending and how the story resolves itself? Sure. Yeah. But the build up thus far hasn't been, has not been great. No, I think Amazing Spider-Man 25, in my opinion, was not a great issue, especially for the price point. For all of the hype, it was very predictable. Yeah. If, and, if you've been reading the story. Mm-hmm. And then to see how things wrap up here and how Kamala Khan gets killed in the comics. Mm-hmm. Um, I understand why. Yeah. I'm not a, a big fan of it. Yeah. It, it, to me, as a reader, I don't think the reasoning she did what she did. Yeah made a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. And I think that how this is going to play off long-term, I think this is going to be a short-term death. Oh, yeah, because she's got a movie coming out later this year. Mm-hmm. And I think that this, it, it kind of falls back on the online theory that we've all read, that this is just to write out away her in human background yep. and make her into a mutant. Yep. Which is what they did in the MCU. Yeah, it's what they did in the cinematic universe, so I'm not super surprised by that. I no. just I just think to do it in this manner, I don't think came off as well as they were hoping it did. There were better ways you could have done it. What they are, I don't know. I'm not a comic writer, but this is not the way you should have done it. No, I, I definitely agree. I think there is there is much more of a, of a different way to pull this off than to have it be an insequential point to a story that she was not a featured member of. Right. Like I'm sorry. Like as a as a featured character. If she was teaming up with Peter Parker throughout this storyline, right? Instead of just a few panels, yeah, I think I'd be able to stomach it a little more. And I go, oh, okay, well, this makes sense. But to do it in such a shock and awe, it would have been, been more shocking if like they called off jo- Jonah. Yeah, if they did like Jonah Jameson or even Mary Jane, which I thought they were going to. Yeah, I thought, okay, maybe that would make some more sense because it would be shocking in how they did it, but. To see a character that had not been around for the majority of this story. Mm -hmm. And is not usually known to be pally pally with Spider-Man. Yeah. Like it just kind of seems. They're acquaintances, but would I call them best friends? They hang out for movie night? No. No. I mean, that's the whole thing. Like it it just kind of seemed like too random of an occurrence. Right. Like they needed to get from point A to point B or point A to point C. And to get to see Spider-Man was point B. Right. And we all know in comics, there's no such thing as a real death unless you're Ben Parker. Yeah. And if they if they ever bring him back, I just Oof. throw everything out the window, but that will never happen. I, I, I feel very certain to say never with that. But with how they set up things here, I know the fan base has been very, very vocal about yeah. not liking the book. And I will say, as far as I've seen today as the book has dropped at the comic shops, mm-hmm. most fans have been at least respectful. The reaction has been a lot better than it was for issue 25. Yeah. Uh, there is no thread on the Spider-Man Reddit that I've seen yet with 900 comments on it, mm-hmm. you know, like there was for issue 25. I think it's one that, and maybe this is what, this is why Marvel decided to reveal the, the plot point early is they saw the reaction. It got online with 25 and they're like, let's head this off before this gets out of control. You know, but the uh, yeah the online reaction I would agree with what you said. It's it's a lot more respectful than it was for twenty five. Yeah, I mean I know I got hot in one Discord too about this too when I read twenty five, and I know that that channel was deleted because I think I got a little too wound up about it. Just because when you talk about such an iconic character as Spider Man, and you're you're doing such a big promotion about the anniversary issue because. Mm-hmm. No matter what kind of legacy numbering or yeah. normal numbering, I guess we could call it. Yeah. Whenever you say like a number one and a 25, a 50, 75, 100, whatever the case is. Right. It means something to fans. And if you're going to hype it up to the point that it was hyped up, you have to deliver on something. Yeah. And you can be disappointed with a book. There's no shame in it. We've talked about this with actually some comic creators that sometimes the sequels don't hit the mark for whatever reason. Yeah. Leaving it at that, but in these kind of situations, you have to deliver something to the fans if you're if you're creating this much buzz about it. But it's up to the fans to handle it in a respectful manner. Mm-hmm. The fact that this week so far, like I say, I haven't dipped into too much social media as we're recording right now, but the reactions have been very. I'm disappointed in this. I'm not. I'm not picking this up, and this is why. It's been a lot more cordial. Mm-hmm. No, I agree with that. And that's what needs to stay that way because if, if anybody is on there threatening a creator, an editor, 
somebody, I'm going to remind you yet again, we're talking about fictional characters. Open a window and go touch some grass. Exactly. Go, there's, go for a walk. Yeah, there's no point to take it to that level. And if you if you don't like something that was done in a comic, just don't pick it up. Yeah. I and mean, that's the easiest thing. Yeah. There is so many more other options at your local comic shops or digital comic shops to go check out. And if you're if you're mad about this, I'm just gonna say hold your anger until you see her get brought back around October. Yeah. Because give, give or take. I'm guaranteeing she's back by October. At least I could I could see September. Well, yeah, exactly. Give, give it give it enough time just cuz how frequently comics come out or infrequently, I guess you could say. Give it enough time to build up. Yeah. Well, we do know that there is a special that is coming out of uh, July, I think. I want to say that yeah. I, that I think is going to tip the hand a little bit about yeah. what the future is for, for Kamala Khan. But I think just in closing with this you, this proves about one the popularity of the character. Yeah. Spider-Man and Miss Marvel too. And just how you don't have to get hung up on one aspect of a character's portrayal. Mm -hmm. You can find many other interpretations to really rally around and find something to enjoy from it. Yeah. And if you don't like a comic, you can go to a a TV show. You can go to a film. You can go to other issues. The one thing is creators like to take a shot to do some things, and sometimes they hit the mark, sometimes they don't. We saw when this movie came out originally as an animated film, we weren't sure what to expect. I mean, the buzz when it first came out was like, what is this? Mm -hmm. And then it turned out to be one of the best animated films of all time. Won a goddamn Oscar. Yeah, an Oscar. Yeah, exactly. So when you see that come to, to play, we just need to sit back and remember, like, if you don't like it, it's okay there's things that you're going to like about a character. There's things you're not going to like about a character. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, you can still be a fan and still be excited to see something involving said character. That's the one thing great about being a fan. You don't have to like everything, but what you do like, that's why you should double in on every time. And that's why I say this week, make sure to go out and see Spider-Man across the Spider-Verse because there's going to be a lot of buzz coming out about this movie the early reviews are ready. I know that 3FN is going to be talking about this next week. I know we'll be talking about this to some certain degree next week as well. And in the meantime, hit us up on that hashtag, hashtag ODPagePod. What is your thoughts about Across the Spider-Verse going into this weekend? And even if you want to have a polite conversation about Amazing Spider-Man 26, we can have that conversation. I have read it. Pat is not. So we'll keep it at that. But if you want to talk some Spider-Man, let's definitely do it. Hashtag ODPagePod. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Hey, guys. It's Alan Dufford here from Top Hat Studios, co-writer and co-creator of Pocus Hocus and Grandma Chainsaw, and you guys are listening to the ODPH Podcast. Coming back for the final segment on this edition of the ODPH Podcast. Pad, what you got? Just two things to talk about. Uh, Both of them are trailer related. We got a trailer today as we record from the folks over at Amazon Prime or Prime Video specifically for season four, the final season of Tom Clancy's Jack Ryan, uh, the television show starring John Krasinski, uh, a.k.a. Mr. Fantastic, a.k.a. From the office. Yes. Uh, So super excited for this. Super surprised it's coming out this soon because season three came out at like the end of last year. It was not that long ago. I was going to say it's pretty short. Not that not that long ago. So but the trailer came out looks super fucking crazy, of course, because with this season, spoiler alert, uh, Jack Ryan is now the head of the CIA. Shit hits the fan sideways, as you would come to expect from the show, and he's going to be expected to pick up the pieces. Mm-hmm. Don't want to give too much away from the trailer if you want to go into spoiler free, but I definitely re- recommend you check out the trailer if you want to find out a little bit what's going on, because as we've seen with this show, it gets crazy, political intrigue, you know. Uh, military intrigue, all the crazy stuff you would expect from a Tom Clancy story. Uh, this one looks like it's uh, not going to leave anything on the floor. It's going to go nuts. Yeah, as they should. I mean, this obviously high expectations for this, yeah. but the trailer looked bananas. Yeah, though. it did. Uh, and then we also got a trailer for the anticipated movie, uh, the next Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie, this one titled Mutant Mayhem. Uh, this, Let's go. This one coming to theaters on August 2nd, uh, written and written by, let me just pull this up here one second, uh, there we go, uh, written by Seth Rogen, Evan Goldberg, and Jeff Rowe, and it has 
one hell of a cast list for this movie. Uh, you have Ro- in this movie, Rose Byrne, Paul Rudd, Seth Rogen, John Cena, Jackie Chan, Giancarlo Esposito, Maya Rudolph, Ice Cube, Post Malone, and Hannibal Burris, just to name a few. That is a loaded. That's loaded. That is a loaded cast list. Uh, I'm going to spoil it right now. John Cena's Rocksteady and Seth Rogen's Bebop. <laughs> I, I can't wait to watch this. This trailer came out, though. It, I'll be honest. I'm a 50-50 Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles fan. I like the cartoon from back in the 80s. Some of the stuff since then with the cartoons, eh, hit or mess for me. Uh, but no, this looks really good. Yeah, this definitely looked really good. I'm with you. I mean, I'm more to the comics version sure. and the little more serious stuff. I mean, the last Ronin, one of the best stories of recent memory. And then even to the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles series that uh, when they do the crossovers. Mm-hmm. Like, that's kind of my wheelhouse for the turtle fandom. Yeah. But I got to admit, like, this looked fun. Yeah, it did. And I know that there's a lot of fans super excited about this. And I tell you what, like, I'm definitely down to go see this when it came out. Like, yeah. I, when I originally heard about it, I was like, eh, I don't know. But after watching that, man, I'm in. I'm mm-hmm. in. No, it looks it looks super awesome. All right. So we got some comic picks this week to talk about. So, Pad, why don't you lead us off? Uh, yeah. So I had three, but one of which we talked about already with Amazing Spider-Man 26. Uh, the other two, though, uh, both of one from D- uh, Dark Horse. The other one from Disney, uh, the one from Dark Horse is, of course, Star Wars The High Republic Adventures, issue number five from Daniel Jose Older. Uh, this one is super awesome because, hey, it's The High Republic. It's great storytelling. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, the description on this one is Jedi Padawan Sav uh, Malgan remains torn between his devotion to the Force and adventurous spirit of youth. But to save her newfound pirate friends, led by the infamous Maz Kanata... Uh, She must delve deeper into the murky underworld and infiltrate a dangerous gang of marauders known as the Dank Grax, uh, G-R-A-K-S. But will her Jedi training be enough to help her save them in time, or will the Grax discover her true identity? So anytime you get to see Maz Kanata show up, in my opinion, it's always a good story. All right. Uh, And then my other pick is the one from Disney, Gargoyles, issue number six. Yeah, you love this series. This one from uh, Greg Weissman, who is the writer of the original Gargoyles series that was on uh, Disney. Uh, so this one is, quote, Brooklyn feels the strain of leadership as hopes for Goliath's release from prison grow dimmer by the hour. Can the members of the Manhattan clan put aside their differences before the crime syndicates of New York combine to crush the entire city? This one literally feels like you could watch the first two seasons because we don't talk about the third season of Gargoyles. <laughs> third season of Gargoyles. I'm sorry if any of the folks who worked on third season of Gargoyles are listening. The third season of Gargoyles is a hot piece of shit. Sorry, is what it is. Yeah, it's it's not good. It's not good. In our opinions. It's not good. Uh, but this one, it feels like if you watch the first two seasons of Gargoyles and go right into issue one of the series, feels like you, you picked her up right where the story left off. It's all sorts of awesome. Goliath, the main gargoyle, is fucking in jail right now. Hmm. They tried to break him out last issue, but he's like, no, no, we can't do this. <laughs> we got to go about this the right way. Uh, so it's going to be interesting to see where this goes. First five issues have all been incredible work from Greg Weissman. I cannot praise this series enough. If you were a fan of the cartoon series in the 90s when it was on Disney, you need to pick this series up. It is, it is, It feels like they picked up right where they left off. Yeah, I I have not got a chance to really catch up on that. I've been meaning to, but I've just been kind of tied up with some other things. The series, I just hear nothing but raves about. Like oh, I said, first, first issue I dug, second one I was like, okay, this is kind of cool. And then just, but everybody's been talking about this, so I got to mm-hmm. take it. I have to take another deep dive into it, but I'm just been way too busy with uh, yeah. other things going on. And like I say, my poll list is very very big. Uh, got, definitely got to do some recommendations though. And one of which, like I said, we we already alluded to Amazing Spider-Man 26. And say what you will about it, but I know that I think if you're if you're a Spider-Man fan, you might want to just take a peruse to it and get your own opinions. Sure. Like I say, some people might really enjoy it. Like I say, it wasn't one for me, but I think it's one that you have to read and form your own opinion on. And some people might really dig it. I, I have to say, it was not my original uh, pick of the week, so to speak. Uh, also from Marvel, though, definitely want to give a plug to the Punisher 12. Now, this has been the reintroduction of Frank Castle. This is the one Jason Aaron has been helming. The story has definitely gone into some wild directions, and that is the easiest way I can describe it. Mm-hmm. The ending is crazy. Like, what the hell just happened? Right. So... If you are into the John Bernthal Punisher, 
that you see on the MCU, you might want to give this a run. Like I say, and especially you've been reading the series. And I know we've had a lot of people in the ODPH Society mention this book. Yeah, I, I picked it up and read it. I was like, what the is going on? Like, mm-hmm. it's that. Sounds like a trip. Yeah, it definitely is a trip. So it's something you definitely want to keep your eyes out for at the comic shops this week. Um, my picks, though, uh, definitely want to mention something coming from the Humanoids imprint, and that is Weapons of the Meta Baron, and this is the oversized edition. So this is another one of the Incal Universe uh, spinoffs. Uh, this is actually one that came out in 2016 in a trade paperback form. Uh, Pat, I know you're not familiar with the, arv- the artist Travis Charseth. No, uh, no. Charist is like growing up. Like I always would keep an eye on his stuff, whether it was with you know DC or Image, and, and like some of the stuff he's done. It just his work is just like so next level. And like I say, I'm just going to show you some pieces from this. Okay. Ooh, those are like look ones. how de- yeah. like detailed that like I say, that's very nice. His artwork is just like oh, like I'm just I I am a very big fan from. My time, you know, growing up, like I say, it was right when he was starting and just seeing the evolution of his art is just like his his stuff is just so damn good. And like I say, the story itself, like I say, if you know anything about the Incal universe, obviously they're they're getting primed for a big uh, resurgence to pop culture. Mm-hmm. Obviously, uh, Taika Waititi is still signed on to do the adaptation to film of right. the universe. So right. this is going to be one to go check out uh, Alexandro Jodorowsky. And um, I apologize if I butcher the name here. Zoran Janjetov. Ooh, okay. Um, are also part of this book. Jorisky is the one who does all the writing. Uh, Charles did, did not finish this book, and um, Janjetov is the one who took it over. Um, so, like I say, it, for me, like I say, it, uh, uh, you know, like I say, the change in art kind of threw me off for a bit. But they do explain why in the book. So, like I say. Uh, but I'm not holding against it. Like I say, I think the book is a very, very solid addition. If you're interested about picking up this universe and getting getting familiar with it, I think this is definitely one you want to go check out, especially because being an oversized edition, they put in a lot of uh, Charest, uh sketchbook in it. And the thing looks amazing. So definitely give this a high recommendation. Gave an 8 out of 10 on my scale about this. And like I say, the story is it's, it's very sci-fi crazy but it's definitely cool like i say the art is what's going to take you home on this one absolutely love this book on that aspect also coming out from image comics is a book from our good friends over at black market narrative but it's not massive verse pad oh yeah deep cuts number two Mm -hmm. so kyle higgins and joe clark are still doing the history of jazz music in comic form, telling some really great stories along as they're going progressing through the decades. Helena Masilis is on the artwork for this. Okay. And like I tell you, awesome artwork. Ooh, that's very nice. Yeah, like I say, it's just kind of got this, you know, like abstract feel to it. But when you, I, and I mentioned this in the review too, when Helena does the big full panels, like they're just such pieces of art. Mm-hmm. Like I say, it's just breathtaking stuff here. So, I am digging this story. I think that like how they're progressing the history of jazz and the impact the music has on people. I really think this is something that if you're looking for something different at the comic shops, like this is something for you. If you're a music fan, you definitely want to check this out. Uh, eight out of 10 on my scale about this. I really think the series is just so dope and just like what they're doing with it. And like I say, it's pretty much self-contained, but the, but the themes are carrying you with. And this is, one is a really interesting one that swings by Chicago in 1928. So definitely want to keep that on your radar. Also from Image Comics, Local Man number four, Tony Fleeks, Tim Seeley. This series, like I say, as, a, as somebody who grew up reading Image Comics, as like the beginning, like we're talking Spawn, Wildcats, Cyber Force, Young Blood, Shadowhawk. Those books, this is like my wheelhouse here, Pat. Okay, and it ties back into it, and it's the story about the fall from grace of one cross Jack and the mystery that is now surrounding him and how basically his fall from grace is still not letting him escape the superhero life. This book is definitely one that I think is flying under a lot of radars and it should be on more people's uh, must talk about list is an excellent story. They do some payoff here for the mystery that's going on with the rising body count that's surrounding him. And I love how they do the flip style book and they take it back to his superhero days, and you're getting the backstory involved in that. Mm-hmm. So this one, definitely keep on your radars at the local comic shops. I Like I say, I, I 
rave about this series. I think it's one of the best ones out there right now, and a lot more people need to be talking about it because it's just very, very cool. And my last pick this week is one that I got to admit, when I first read it, like I caught the headline, I was like, oh, this this looks interesting. Mm -hmm. And then I got into it, and I will tell you this. If you're a fan of like old school Jack Kirby sci-fi stuff, right? this is up your alley. And it is The Savage Strength of Starstorm, number one, mm. by Drew Craig and Jason Feinstone. Now, I did mention this in the blog that if the name Craig sounds familiar with comics, Wes Craig is his brother. We know his work from Deadly Class. Okay. But this is one that is just sci-fi oh. and it's a it's a cool thing and I want yeah. I want Pad's like honest reaction when he sees this piece of art right here. Holy shit. This is very Jack Kirby-esque. There's yeah. a there's a whole full spin out. Yeah. And like I say, if you're looking for something that feels like a throwback almost and it pays homage to like I say, the minute I read this I immediately thought Jack Kirby. It, just the style yeah. and just how the you have a mysterious teenager that is, has amnesia, but is now caught in the middle of something that we're we are tagging along as fans of seeing him ascend as a hero. Mm -hmm. And there's much going on with his character that just has scratched the surface. Like I say, a meteor hits where he is, in, like in a high school that he's in, and just things go a little crazy from there. But if you're looking for something that's like sci-fi adventure action. I tell you what, this book I thought really, really was one that was on my radar. Eight out of ten on on my scale about that. I think it's very worth picking up at the comic shops, and I'm like, I'm definitely back for issue number two, no question about that. And man, there is just a lot to pick up at the comic shops this week. So as we always say to end the entertainment edition of the ODPH, make sure to go out and hit up your local comic shops wherever you're at. And make sure you go out and support all the indie podcasts that are covering it right now. And a special shout out to our guy, Matt from Hops Geeks News. He made a little list on Good Pods for Ooh. top five comic podcasts, and the ODPH is on there. Nice. Yeah, got some great com great uh, fellow podcasts on there. So if you want to go check that out, and you should be following Hops Geeks News too because Matt's absolutely crushing that right now. Make sure to go check that out. And like I say, we steer you in the right direction because we're fans too, and we'll tell you a lot of cool stuff to pick up. That being said... For anything and everything that is the ODPH, you can find it at odphpodcast.com. That's it for this week. So for the one, only Padawan J. Word to the wise, don't ask Harrison Ford who would win in a fight between Han Solo and Indiana Jones. You'll just piss him off. Really? Yes. Uh, so he was asked that question, and he, and he said, quote, well, they usually ask me if there was a fight between Han Solo and Indiana Jones, who would fucking win? And I say, me, asshole. I don't want to fucking make shit up like that. I mean, what are you asking me that crap for? Close quote. I, you know what? Anybody else, I would kind of question it, but it's, it's Harrison Ford it's and he's Har like 80 years old. Yep. I fully see him doing that. Yep. I'm your host, Ken M. Make sure to make your voice heard in the radiant black vote. It ends this week. Hashtag team Nathan all day, every day. We'll put the link up on the website or on a tweet this week, uh, the next couple days. So you definitely want to make sure your voice is heard. Thank you as always for listening to another edition of the ODPH podcast, better known as the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour. We'll see you next time.